dear PhD graduates of Institut Polytechnique de Paris, it is a great honor to welcome and celebrate all of you today on your well-deserved graduation. I would like to sincerely congratulate all of you on it. You are 238 brilliant students to receive this degree, and each of you should be proud of it. It is a token of your excellent research skills, the hard work, and the unwavering commitment you have demonstrated throughout the years. You spent at the two doctoral schools of Institut Politique de Paris, the Adama Doctoral School of Mathematics, and the IP Paris Doctoral School. Tonight is a unique and quite emotional celebration. You are the first graduates of the IP Paris PhD program. When you started your PhD, you were coming from very diverse uh, backgrounds, excellent universities, 20% of you from the IP Paris schools, and many others from our partners, Université Paris-Saclay, uh, Sorbonne University, and many others on a global basis. By deciding to follow a PhD program at Institut Polytechnique de Paris, you showed that you understood our project. Five historic French schools, which have been training highly skilled scientists in their respective and complementary fields for more than two centuries, joining forces to train future leaders and generate a research of excellence and impact. You made the choice to increase your scientific strike force and stay in the way of technical excellence. The scientific and technical excellence, Institut Politique de Paris proved it, I would say, last week, uh, in particular through the new QS ranking 2022. We are now in the top 50 global institution of education and research, second in France and in European Union, as well as top 15 in employers' reputation. I think this is a great recognition of what the Institute is building, but also I hope it should make all of us, including you, very proud to be part of such an Institute recognized globally. Our increased international reputation and our success in being building solid and fulfilling programs, we draw them from the many resources that we have, in particular, all the labs of IP Paris and their eminent researchers, with which you were able to interact throughout your degree. Moreover, you are able to get an amazing multidisciplinary training anchored in the French scientific rigor, theoretical approach, while cultivating human relations and soft skills within a diverse and international environment. And you are a living proof of this diversity. 41% of you are international. The great majority of you are from Europe, but many also from you are from Asia, biggest community coming from China, but also from, from North Africa, as well as South and North America, as well as the Middle East. Also, around 30% of you are women, which is an encouraging result for us to keep pushing science to be more inclusive and diverse. Throughout those years, you have showed your devotion to IP Paris and have developed new skills and values. By graduating from this PhD program, whether you are going to follow an academic or research career, work in the R&D department of an industrial group, participate in one of the greatest public research organization, or even, even create your own startup, you are from now on all united around values which IP Paris instill in you or help you develop. First, believing in the power of science and technology to respond to the rapid changes and transformations and shape a brighter and more sustainable future for the society as a whole. Ambition and a sense of collectiveness also to make science progress. As you learn how to conduct your research by yourself, it helps you gain audacity as well as self direction and leadership skills. But you also acquired a great sense of patience and learn to surround yourselves with the right people. I am sure this also helps you develop interpersonal skills and a sense of respect, highly sought after in the professional world and crucial to feel fulfilled in your future career and to build impactful initiatives. Finally, an innovative mind. Thanks to the endless innovation capabilities of IP Paris, empowered by partnerships between every society's stakeholders, including the industrial world. As you had to deal with a number of actors, from industrial partners to researchers, you are therefore aware that it is necessary to tackle major economic and societal challenges, including clean energy, climate change, artificial intelligence, data analysis, biomedical engineering, and cybersecurity, to name a few of these challenges. I hope you took full advantage of the rich networks you are lucky to get access to at Institut Polytechnique de Paris. 
Now, I would also like to thank Professor Laszlo, Professor Tapus, Professor Rueff, as well as all your thesis supervisor and co-supervisors, all the researchers in the labs who help you, as well as the graduate school and doctoral school administrative office for the support they have provided to you uh, to ensure your best education and environment to succeed. They will announce in a few minutes the laureates for the thesis awards, and I would also like to congratulate uh, them personally in advance for their particular outstanding performance. As all your names will appear on the screen throughout the ceremony, you will probably look back on your experience at Institut Polytechnique de Paris, full of amazing memories, I hope. I would like you to also think about what this diploma means to you and how you will be able to make use of it in your future career. At your small scale with your thesis, you can be sure that you have helped these various scientific domains progress and have therefore made your mark on the history of science. You have been able to impose your view, your way, the way you, know, uh, you deal with this particular topic you chose, how it should be tackled. And this is what Institut Petit de Paris is about and what your supervisors, and I would like to, you to take away, transcend the frontiers of science and technology for the benefit of business and society. You are carving out the way for your peers behind you and are the first ambassadors of the PhD program at Institut Polytechnique de Paris, helping our recognition as a leading education and research institution, and more specifically of our PhD programs, obviously, both in France as well as around the world. You have the means to show that French PhD training is excellent and significant. I wish also you continue to aspire to inspire others with humility and humanity. So in conclusion, my sincere congratulations again to all of you the new graduates of the PhD program of Institut Petit de Paris. I wish you all the best in your career. So I would like to thank uh, Eric Labay, so the president of IP Paris, for the introductory presentation. So hello everyone. So some of you or most of you maybe know me already. So I'm Adriana Tapus and I'm a professor at Insta Paris and also so the director of the doctoral school of IP Paris. And together with my colleague, uh, Francois, Professor Francois Rueff, IP Paris representative of the Adamar Doctoral School of Mathematics, we would like to warmly welcome you to this first IP Paris PhD graduation ceremony. Unfortunately, so the ceremony couldn't be organized in a face-to-face -face meeting um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And here we are in a virtual gathering. I would like to start with sincere congratulations to the 238 new doctors receiving their doctoral degrees today. 200 in the Doctoral School of IP Paris and 38 in the Adamar Doctoral School of Mathematics. Among those celebrating today, there are 69 women and 97 international PhD graduates. Of course, so today it's really a celebration day, and I'm sure that you are all accompanied by your family members, friends, partners, and spouses, and that they all are very proud and thrilled to attend this ceremony. You have traveled a long path. You spent three or four or even more years of your life working hard on a particular cutting edge topic, and you demonstrated that you can do innovative research and earn doctorates from IP Paris, one of the best universities in the world. I would like to thank your families and friends for all the support during this period. And last but not least, I would like to congratulate your professors and supervisors who have supported you during this trip and that provided you with an exceptional educational and helped you develop your research capabilities. 
The Doctoral School of IP Paris, it's a multidisciplinary doctoral school with no fences between the research domains and fields and increases and encourages interdisciplinary research work. Therefore, some of you studied physics, biology, chemistry, information, communication, electronics, computer science, artificial intelligence, engineering, mechanics, energetics, economy, management, and social sciences. Furthermore, mathematics, are interfaced with various other dis disciplines. For this reason, they have always been involved in the education and research of the five founding schools. This is reflected in today's doctoral studies in mathematics of IP Paris, which include pure mathematics, applied mathematics, and mathematics at interfaces that are part of the Adamar Doctoral School of Mathematics. But you may wonder what it's different now with respect with when you started your thesis. So first, people can call you doctor, even though you are not a medical doctor. Second, as a holder of a doctoral degree from IP Paris, you receive the highest educational degree and you are now capable of working independently in your research topic. And last but not the least, you built a strong scientific foundation and you are ready now to face new challenges in your professional life. The degree that you are receiving today from IP Paris, a world-class university, equips you well for your working life. Don't be afraid to explore new horizons. Be confident in your achieved capabilities and research skills Never get discouraged, always stay positive and be proud of your degree and of your alma mater, IP Paris. And to conclude, as Albert Einstein said, try not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. I really would like to congratulate again all of you and thank you for all the hard work that you have produced. And right now, let me introduce you our invited keynote speaker, Franz Bojak, CEO and co-founder of Senzo. Uh, so let me say a few words about Franz. Franz obtained a master's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Stuttgart and a PhD from Ecole Polytechnique in biomedical engineering on your optimization of stents. He is also a graduate of the Stanford Ignite Polytechnic Business Program. In 2014, he co-founded Sensum and some uh, has since brought together a team of renowned scientists, engineers, and doctors to realize his vision of connected medical devices. He was also named innovator under 35 by the MIT Technology Review in 2016. Pant, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adriana. Um, you might think uh, it sucks to be part of the class graduating in 2021. No real reception, no gathering in joy. All you get is this video conference one of oh so many video conferences that you had to suffer through in these past 15 months. I'd like to offer a different perspective though. This moment in time does not suck at all because you have been given very unique circumstances, a once in a lifetime opportunity. You have the opportunity to become a PhD after the complete breakdown of everything we considered normal, so that you can now be a driving force of creating the new normal, a new world that is more resilient, more equitable, and more sustainable. Dear President, distinguished guests, dear faculty, and proud families, I would like to congratulate all the PhD graduates of the 2021 class, builders of a new world. It is a great honor to speak to you today 
on this particular occasion in this very first IP Paris graduation and honor and the huge responsibility that was laid on my shoulders. And so I wonder why, why me? Probably similar as you wondered just now, why the heck is he expecting of me to be a builder of a new world? Why is he asking the impossible of me? Well, it's simple. Society, your families and yourselves, all of them have invested a lot to get you here, here to this very point, this very moment when you are a PhD. Cherish it because it will be over soon. Yesterday, you were a doctoral candidate. Tomorrow, you will be already a postdoc. So it's only today that you're actually a PhD. And after all this investment, you're ready now. As Adriana just said, you have all the tools to change the world. That is why you're in a unique position in this 2021, having graduated with a PhD from one of the best doctoral schools in the entire world. To so why it's me standing in front of you today, here's what I came up with, though I can't know for sure, of course. I was on your side some seven years ago, just having founded a little startup called Senso. And this startup seems to have attracted some attention in the community of recovery technique. And whoever decided that it should be me talking to you today thought that this path from PhD to entrepreneur might present a great example of what can become of you once you finish your PhD. Well, to be honest though, Sensum hasn't done all that much yet. We set out to change the lives of patients and we are still not quite there yet as we haven't even touched a single patient. But what we did do on this Pass is we developed the smallest tissue sensor in the world and integrated it into a tiny medical device, just some hundreds of microns in diameter, a feat that even today is considered to be impossible. Later this year, however, we will finally be able to demonstrate how this tiny sensor can make a big difference in the lives of patients all over the world. So how did we achieve to build the impossible? Well, if you want to know our secret sauce, then of course uh, you need to sign an NDA. No, of course, I'm joking. I can tell you what is our secret sauce. It is having the most extraordinary team in the world. And what makes this team so extraordinary, you ask? Well because it's composed of individuals that know their why. They know why they are getting up every morning and why they want to change patients' lives. And this is the true secret. It is knowing your why. You have invested so much into your education to come all the way to here. And all of you know how hard it is to finish a PhD with those many ups and downs, moments when you feel lonely, maybe lost, out of ideas, but you made it. And maybe in those moments, you already asked yourself, why? Why am I doing this? And this is when you needed to look deep inside yourself to figure out that one answer in order to continue. The fact that you're here today with us tells me that there's a good chance you did that very exercise and already found the answer for yourself. But maybe you came all this way because you had to or were told to because it was expected of you. If you belong to people who have found their why, I want to congratulate you. You can log off now as this speech will not give you much more. One thing before you leave though, Keep this why with you for the rest of your life and use it to guide you on your path. But if you haven't yet found your why, then I must insist you ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Before you take any other step. Because if you do not, you risk getting lost in the middle of the road. And believe me, this will likely strike you at a moment when you need that questioning the least. So take the time now to look inward and think about what drives you, why you are doing what you're doing, why you, come, why you came to here to this very moment. 
Steve Jobs once called this connecting the dots, looking backward. Look back at your life and connect those dots. Start in the beginning, your earliest memories, and try to figure out why you made those key decisions in your life going forward. Why did I go to university? Why did I choose the very PhD subject I chose? Why did I do it? And more likely than not, you might discover that you actually do have a why, but you weren't conscious about it. That there was this feeling in your gut all along, this force that was always guiding you every step along the way. You'll be so happy when you discover it and follow your why much, much more consciously. It will make your life so much easier because suddenly you will feel this force and you will be able to use this force to guide you on your path rather than just blindly following an inner calling that you do not understand. Before I will let you go and enjoy this very moment of being a PhD, I want to share with you my own why. To understand my why, I need to mention three women and two men that have shaped my life. Of course, there are many people who I've had the privilege of meeting over the past 37 years and who contributed to the person that is standing in front of you today. But I want to particularly point out these five because they profoundly shaped my why. Number one is my mother who instilled in me a spirit that I should never settle for less than being the best at what I do. The second one is my wife, whose love and support enable me to do what I do every single day. The third is my daughter, who is showing me the beauty of discovering the wonders of this world with untainted eyes. The fourth, my grandfather, who woke my life for math and taught me what it really meant to be an engineer. And the fifth is George Lucas. Thanks to these people, I was able to follow my why from very early on in my life. At the age of seven, I saw Star Wars for the very first time, and I wanted, and all I wanted to do was to build those spaceships. So I learned math, and I became an aerospace engineer. So at 27 years old, I had reached what I desired and was ready for a PhD to develop the next generation of space engines. And there, my life hit a very surprising fork in the road. I was offered to do a PhD at a corporate technique in biomedical engineering. So the question for me was, what shall I do? Follow my apparent dream job, staying in aerospace engineering, or discover a completely new field that I had absolutely no idea about and see if I managed to apply, to apply my engineering skills to the medical field. As you might guess, I chose the letter. But why, you might ask, why did he do that? Because I realized that my true why all these years was not to build spaceships. That is a what, as not so much a why. But my true why was the need to push my, myself out of my comfort zone, going the hard and challenging path, not the quick and easy one. The path that would allow me to become an always better version of myself to eventually fulfill the true duty of any engineer, to be a pillar of society, solve problems that will allow mankind to go on. So that at the end of my life, I can look back, connecting the dots to proudly say, let's do it just like that once more. So find your why to build a better world as it will be your force, your compass, your North Star that will guide you through the uncertainty that lies ahead always. Thank you. Thank you, Franz, for this really inspiring presentation uh, that I'm sure it was very much appreciated by all the doctors, faculty, and researchers present here in the graduation ceremony. And now we give the floor to Yves Laszlo, so the chairman of academics and research of Institut Polytechnique de Paris. He will tell you more about the IP Paris Best Thesis Award. If Thank you, Adriana. So good, good evening, everyone. So I am Yves Laszlo. I am a 
we're all doctor. Um, believe it or not, I have got my PhD in the last century, so meaning 31 years ago, uh, in algebraic geometry, so I am a mathematician. So I'm very happy uh, to be with you uh, as a new doctor of Institut Polytechnique de Paris. First of all, let me thank all the participants. When we have decided that Institut Polytechnique de Paris would award annually three prizes to the applicants who had produced the best PhD thesis and made the most outstanding contributions, we could not imagine that we will be unanimously impressed by the quality of the thesis, which was sincerely particularly high. It cast light on the commitment of all those who participated in the project. I personally congratulate you for the energy and time spent on your work. I can tell you that selecting and deciding between the candidates has been difficult, very difficult exercise for us. And I want to pay tribute to the work carried out by the PhD award committee in various fields, whose members come from various fields, physics, biology and chemistry, information theory, communication, electronics, computer science, data, and artificial incision, engineering, mechanics, and energetics, economics, management, and social sciences. And of course, last but not least, mathematics. At Institut Polytechnique de Paris, we support the development of research in PhD with enthusiasm. You must know that the emergence of 10 IP Paris departments, disciplinary departments, of three interdisciplinary centers, including one created in, 20, in 2019, a joint laboratory with an industrial cooperation on laser and plasma physics, are some flagship actions to create a genuine Institute Polytechnique de Paris Research Center. And today, we can be proud of the great success of this edition. Out of the 70 cases examined, I am pleased to announce that we have seven winners. Three executive winners for the best thesis award, who will each receive 3,000 euros, and four special mentioned execo will each receive 1,000 euros. Congratulations. To conclude, I also wanted to tell you to all the candidates and PhD students that the story does not end there. IP Paris is here to continue with you, to support you throughout your career, and to promote scientific excellence. Thanks a few. I wish you a rich, successful career with great scientific achievements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve, for this uh, presentation and for introducing and presenting so the IP Paris Best Thesis uh, uh, Award. As previously mentioned just right now, so there are three Best Thesis Award execo. So we are inviting all the awardees in alphabetically order to quickly present so the thesis work. So we start with Dr. Ambre Bouillon and her thesis on spontaneous light and frost dynamics. Ambre defended her thesis in December 2019 in the domain of engineering, mechanics, and energy. So Ambre, we are all listening to you. Hello, um, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, for the introduction. I'm extremely honored to be awarded um, the, the prize for the, one of the best uh, thesis by uh, IP um, Polytechnique. And I grab here uh, the opportunity to tell you a bit more about my work, my PhD work. So I did my PhD with Christophe Clanet and uh, David Kerry 
at uh, LADIX uh, in Ecole Polytechnique uh, about uh, some uh, problem uh, related to um, laden frost droughts. And I will first uh, shortly tell you a bit more about the laden frost effect, and then I will present you uh, also shortly uh, one of the effects we discovered. So let's uh, first take a look at a, a small amount of liquid uh, and look at its behavior on a solid. If the solid is uh, brought at a room temperature, the drop adopts a lens shape and uh, is really quiet. And um, if we increase now the temperature of the plate, for example, at 70 degrees, there is no much difference. Uh, the only difference is that the drop will evaporate uh, more quickly. But then if we cross the water boiling point, uh, the uh, behavior of the drop dramatically changes. The drop violently uh, boils and uh, evaporates quickly. But very surprisingly, if we raise the temperature above a certain threshold, about uh, 200 degrees, we see a very uh, different behavior. We now see that the drop adopt a, a quasi-spherical uh, shape and recover its quietness. So this very uh, surprising uh, phenomenon has been reported first um, about three centuries ago by Dr. Leiden Frost. And um, it relies actually uh, on the existence of a vapor cushion uh, underneath the drop that first uh, thermally insulates the liquid so that the, the drop can uh, survive for a few minutes. But then this vapor cushion also prevents any contact between the liquid uh, the liquid and the solid so that uh, boiling uh, is suppressed and uh, the drop uh, is highly mobile there is no uh, addition so that when you uh, um, deposit drops on a on a hot pan you can see that they uh, flee away uh, in all direction so you're probably all familiar with this uh, transition as it occurs right in front of you when you're cooking and for a long time we saw that the mobility of those droplets were due to the fact that uh, first, the drop are frictionless, but also due to the presence of external perturbation, like air flows or a tiny slope uh, at, the, uh, at the pan. And um, what we, we try to, to understand uh, in, in my PhD is to, to what is the, 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 the intrinsic reason for uh, those drops to be uh, such a mobile. So um, I reproduced this experiment uh, under very controlled uh, uh, condition in the lab by limiting air flows and adjusting the horizontality as much as possible. And uh, I released from rest 100 drops uh, with a radius of one millimeter. And here I collect on this uh, diagram uh, the trajectory of those uh, 100 uh, droplets um, uh, seen from above. So what you can see is that uh, when uh, released, the drop uh, flee away from their initial position and propel in all direction. So the isotropy of uh, the trajectory shows actually that this is not a gravity effect. There is uh, an intrinsic force that self propel uh, the, those uh, droplets. So to understand the reason why um, the drop are such mobile and move in all direction, uh, we get uh, the idea to uh, seed the liquid with some uh, tracer particles. Uh, and to look from the side. Um, so, uh, for example, here I show side views of the internal flow. And what we can see is that a big drop flattened by gravity hosts very strong flow with velocity of about five centimeters per second. So very strong at the scale of a millimetric drop. But those uh, flow are first symmetric. But as the drop evaporates, it will shrink. And at some point, uh, there will not be uh, enough room for two vortices. So there will be a, a break in symmetry. And uh, for a, a tiny drop, a quasi spherical uh, drop, we only see one rolling cell. So the drop um, 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 behave like a, a, a liquid wheel. And this has this asymmetric uh, internal motion has funny uh, consequences because now if we um, um, uh, freeze the drop from a needle uh, uh, and look from the side, we can see that uh, once the drop detaches from the needle, it flees away, it roll, uh, rolls away like a liquid wheel. So for a long time, we saw that those uh, tiny drops were super mobile because of, uh, of uh, their frictionless nature, but actually they host uh, an internal motor that explain their uh, spectacular mobility. 
So I would like uh, to end by uh, acknowledging uh, IP uh, Paris for, for this uh, award and uh, also to thank um, uh, Ecole Polytechnique, um, the people from LADIX and my two PhD advisors for those uh, very enriching uh, three years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amber, for this presentation. Very nice and very interesting. And now let's go to Dr. Boris Muzelek. His thesis was defended in October 2020, and it's about leveraging regularization, projections, and elliptical distribution in optimal transport. His thesis is in mathematics, but also in computer science, big data, and artificial intelligence domains. So Boris, the floor is yours. Okay, so... Uh, thank you, Professor Tapus, for the introduction, and I am very honored to receive this prize. Uh, so I did my thesis at uh, NCE Paris, uh, IP Paris, under the supervision of uh, Marco Couturi, on the general topic of applying the mathematical theory of optimal transport to data sciences and machine learning. So first, uh, what exactly is optimal transport? Well, optimal transport is a mathematical theory uh, that studies the problem of transporting mass at the minimal cost. It was first formulated by Monge in the 18th century, who observed uh, workers that were doing earth moving works, that is, they were moving piles of sand to fill trenches. And he raised the question on how those workers could organize themselves to minimize the total effort they, they have to produce. So he assumed that you could represent uh, the cost of moving a unit of uh, mass from a location X to a location T of X, uh, you can measure that cost using a cost function C of X, Y. And he uh, looked at those maps that transform uh, a part of sand onto another while minimizing the total cost of doing so. So this is a very challenging mathematical problem. And for that reason, it remained uh, somewhat forgotten for about a century until it was revived by mathematicians like Kantorovich, who focused on a variation of this problem uh, that is a discrete version of this problem. And an example of such a problem is uh, how to transport goods at minimal cost. So let's assume that you have factories. Uh, each factory produces a, cert a certain quantity of goods and you have stores and each store requires a, cent a certain quantity of goods. And the problem that Kantorovich studies, studied is how to transport the goods from the factories to the stores in such a way that you minimize the, the cost of transporting them. And this time, instead of having an optimization, an optimization problem over maps, you have an optimization problem over matrices in that case, or more gen generally over uh, couplings between distributions, which is a simpler problem. So this is fine, but so I said that my thesis was about applying optimal transport to data sciences. So why should we care about optimal transport in machine learning and data sciences? Well, it turns out that in machine learning, we often need to compare distributions. So in a typical setting, uh, we might observe data, which can be images, for instance, and we can represent this data as a discrete distribution, meaning a distribution that has one supporting point per uh, observed data. And we might want to fit a model, uh, say a neural network, over this data. And to do so, we need a way of comparing the learned model, the neural network, to the data we observed. And it turns out the optimal transport is a robust way of comparing probability distributions that enjoys many favorable properties that makes it uh, particularly suitable uh, for machine learning. However, there is one drawback, a major drawback to optimal transport, and that is its computational costs. And the way we compute optimal transport essentially depends on the type of data we, or in the type of data we're considering. So in the case of discrete data, we can compute optimal transport by solving an optimization problem, which costs over n cube operations where n is the size of our data. And this is problematic because in machine learning, n is typically very large. And so this n cube cost uh, quickly becomes uh, prohibitive for machine learning applications. However, there is a workaround. If we're ready to make an approximation uh, by adding what's called entropic localization, uh, then we can bring this cost down to greater than n squared operations, uh, which is already more reasonable. If we're working with continuous data, on the other hand, then unfortunately there's no general, general uh, scalable method that's available. Um, however, if we make additional assumptions, uh, for instance, that the data is one dimensional or that the data is Gaussian or elliptical, then uh, optimal transport admits an analytical expression, meaning that 
optimal transport has a formula, so to say. And in the case of Gaussian or elliptical distributions, this defines the so-called Burs-Wasserstein geometry. And so the contributions of my thesis are essentially twofold. So in the first part, I developed tools for applying uh, the Burs-Wasserstein geometry to machine learning applications. Uh, so I proposed algorithms to efficiently compute the Burs-Wasserstein distance and to compute its gradients. And then I applied those tools to uh, large machine learning applications, such as word embeddings in natural language processing. And then the second part of my thesis, I studied the interactions between uh, different approaches uh, that were used independently by uh, machine learning pr practitioners to use optimal transport uh, that are low dimensional projections, entropy localization, and the Burs-Wasserstein geometry. And I showed that at the intersection of those three approaches uh, lied uh, a continuum of uh, possible approaches to use optimal transport in uh, machine learning and data sciences in general. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks to the jury uh, for the prize. And thank you, Marco, for those wonderful PhD years. Thank you very much, um, Boris. And yeah. uh, right now, so I would like also to invite uh, Dr. Clemence Tricot. Uh, she defended her thesis in June 2020, and her thesis is about essays in political economy and public economics. So the domain of her thesis economics. So you can start now your presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, Adriana, for the introduction. And above all, thanks a lot for this prize. Uh, I'm extremely honored. And I would like to thank uh, IP uh, Paris and Crest, and in particular, my two amazing advisors, Pierre Boyer and Bruno Crepon, uh, for their support throughout uh, my PhD. Um, so let's now uh, try to summarize um, four, hour, uh, four years of PhD in uh, five minutes. So I want to start uh, by outlining the big questions that are driving uh, my work. And so broadly defined, my goal is to better understand the determinants and consequences of political agent behavior. So first at the electoral stage, how citizens uh, decide to vote, whether or not to vote and for whom to vote, how candidates decide to become candidate and to enter a political race. And then second at the post electoral stage, how policymakers uh, decide over local public policies. And so in my PhD, I developed three uh, research papers trying to uh, provide some uh, broad answers to these uh, questions. So the two first are joint with Vincent Pons and uh, study electoral uh, behaviors, where the last one study uh, policymakers' behaviors and local public policies. So let me briefly uh, summarize uh, my main uh, findings. So the first paper uh, asked whether voters behave strategically or expressively when they decide to vote and uh, how it affects the electoral results, so who wins the election. So here you can think about an election with three candidates, one from the left, one from the right, and one from the Green Party. Let's say you prefer the candidate for the Green Party, but you also know that this candidate has a very little chance of winning the election. Then you face a trade-off between voting expressively for your favorite or voting more strategically, perhaps for the left candidate, because you would prefer the left to win over the right. And so we study how people behave uh, in elections by comparing elections with two or three candidates in the second round of French local and parliamentary elections. And so in my example, for instance, we look at what happens when the green candidate enters the race on top of the left and the right. Do people start voting for the green candidate or do they strategically stick uh, to their second base choice, uh, the left candidate. And what we find is that many voters uh, will start voting for a small third uh, candidate, meaning that they value voting expressively over voting strategically for their second best. And this has a strong impact on who wins the election. So in my example, for instance, we find that having a small third uh, green uh, candidate will change who wins among the left and the right in 20% of the races. So in one fifth of the cases, the left will lose the election where the left would have won absent uh, the third candidate. So basically we find that voters are driven by the expressive voting of voting for their favorite candidate. Then my second uh, research project is still about electoral behaviors. And here ask which types of information are likely to affect candidate and voters behavior. And in particular, I focus on the effect on rankings 
and I look at how rankings of candidates in the first round of the election will impact their chance of victory in the second round. So I will look at two candidates that basically had the same vote share in the first round, but one candidate just had one vote above and it thus labeled first after the first round, while the other had just one vote below and it thus labeled second. And so I compare marginally first to marginally second candidates and I see whether their ranking affect their chances of victory. And the answer is yes, I find a very large effect. So being just first instead of second will increase your chance of winning the election by more than 6%. And this is driven both by candidates who have some dropout agreements between the two rounds based on rankings, but it's also driven by voters who display a desire to vote for their winner. So they are more likely to vote for a candidate that is just labeled first rather than second, creating what we call a bandwagon effect for these candidates. So overall, those two projects show that voters uh, behave expressively and they're also likely influenced uh, by spiced electoral results. And finally, the third chapter of my PhD turns to policymakers when they are elected and look at local public policies. And in particular, I look at the impact of intermunicipal cooperation. So what happens when municipalities and mayors have to jointly decide over public policy? And by looking at that, I also ask why municipalities are generally reluctant to do so. So to look at the impact of intermunicipal cooperation, I exploit a 2010 reform in France that made cooperation mandatory, meaning that it forced municipalities to enter an intermunicipal community and to share their public policies. And by looking at this reform, I can look at the causal impact of integration for those municipalities that were forced to cooperate and that did not want to do it in the first place. And my findings show that those municipalities had to face some local cost of integration that helps explain why they did not want to cooperate in the first place. And so first I find that urban municipalities, once they have to share their urban planning policies, they end up with more construction on their territory than what they would have chosen absent cooperation. And then for rural municipalities, I find that once they have to share their local public services, they end up with fewer local public services such as daycare, or public libraries. And so this shed light on the impact of intermunicipal cooperation and on the reasons why municipality might be reluctant to cooperate. So I would like to end uh, by thank you, uh, uh, by thank you all again, uh, IP Paris, Crest, and my advisors. And um, feel free to email me or look out at my website for the papers if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clemence. Thank you also uh, the three of you for all these nice presentations that show the excellence of your work. As it also was mentioned earlier, so there are also four best thesis award runner up, Execo also. Uh, it was really very hard to, for the deliberations. I would also like then to mention in alphabetical order, Vincent Coglet, Guillaume Graciani, Jawad Murtada, and Emile Parola. I would like to congratulate all of them and also all of you for the, the excellent work that you have conducted at IP Paris. And you should be proud to be an alumni of IP Paris. Once again, so let me offer my sincere congratulations to uh, each and every one of you. I look forward to reading some interesting research that you will produce and hearing about your successes. One more thing before closing so the event, in order to collect your diploma, please contact so the doctoral school administration office and they will provide you with more information. I would now like to wish you all a great evening and thank you for participating in this first IP Paris PhD graduation ceremony. So let's give all of you a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>